All right. Well, again, welcome back uh, to week two of six. So, again, the first three weeks here, um, we are uh, looking at um, we're looking at the church's relationship to government again through this study from uh, Lutheran Ministries called "We the People." Uh, and then for the last three weeks, uh, we're going to spend three weeks looking at the church's relationship to science, um, especially looking at some bioethical issues, again, with the vaccine and all that stuff. So um, making sure that uh, we have a good biblical view of that. So tonight, uh, as you can see in your handout, again, if you're online, uh, we'll have the handout up here. Uh, our focus is on uh, the history of our nation and uh, the question of whether or not it's actually a Christian nation and what that means. Uh, so last week we spent most of our time focusing on uh, what the church says in relationship to the, or excuse me, what the Bible says about uh, the two kingdoms. So we got the kingdom of the left, kingdom of the right. Uh, so we got the civil world and uh, the world of the church. And so each has a different function. Each has a different calling by God. But again, God is Lord over one, over both. So again, uh, this, uh, the state is called to uh, enforce laws, uh, to keep things under control in civil society. The church's job is to proclaim uh, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. And so again, we want each of them to stay in their own lanes. Uh, today, we're going to build on this uh, and again, look at a little bit more of the history of the church. Uh, so if you didn't grab a handout, again, they're on the back uh, counter back there. Uh, again, everything's up on the screen as well. Um, could you, Pastor, could you put that in focus a little better? It's a little blurry. That's as best as I can do. <laughs> That's best? <laughs> Well, let me rub my eyes hey, here. Let me get a better. If, uh, <laughs> if you want to donate to uh, upgrade the projection in here, no, I'm accepting donations. <laughs> so it's all right. It's all the same material in your uh, handout, so you'll be fine. So yeah. <laughs> I could mess around with it, only make it worse though. I'm sorry. Really? Oh yeah. Okay, I just thought. <laughs> well, let's start with prayer here. So, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Uh, we do thank you for this season of Lent, uh, Lord, as we um, continue our, our journey through Lent. We thank you uh, for where this destination takes us, uh, the cross and the empty tomb. Uh, Lord, tonight as we take a look at uh, our nation, uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of government. And uh, we ask that you would give us godly government, uh, godly leaders uh, in every way so that, uh, again, we can have peaceful and quiet lives, uh, lives where we can uh, uh, rejoice uh, in the gospel, lives where we can worship you freely and lives where we can uh, spread the good news uh, to all people everywhere. So as always, Lord, we pray that you would bless our time together. Uh, Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to be present here in a special way. We pray all this and more in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So again, on um, on the front page of your handout, so again, online, uh, this is what you see right here. Uh, just a reminder, we looked at this last week. Um, and again, we got plenty of seats. Feel free. There's also more chairs. Uh, so make yourselves comfortable. Um, so again, just a reminder of the description of terms. And a lot of this stuff is going to come up, uh, especially today when we look at the history of uh, America, especially with regards to deism uh, and some of the driving forces behind that. So stuff like ceremonial deism, uh, deism, democracy, uh, this establishment cause, again, we're going to look at that a little bit today, uh, and so forth, you know, the theocracy. Uh, but the two kingdoms, we spent a lot of time looking at that last week. So again, as we uh, cover these different areas, um, again, it's good to go back and just remind ourselves what some of these words mean. Um, and so tonight, um, again, as we look at this next part here, as I'll scroll down. So again, you don't have to scroll down if you got the paper handouts, just flip to the next page. Um, so lesson two, scroll, 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 a Christian nation, Really? So again, uh, we're going to watch this video. So again, a reminder, as I mentioned last time, uh, this was really designed to be a men's study. So again, whenever they say, you know, men, just say, insert people, women, whatever you want. Uh, but again, it only pops up a couple of times. Um, so let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. And let's all go ahead and say this prayer together. Uh, the opening prayer as printed on the handout. Or again, you can see up on the screen if your eyes aren't blurry. Uh, so, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, through Jesus our sins are forgiven. Through baptism you wiped our slate clean and claimed us as your children. We ask that you grant us a better understanding of your purpose for earthly governments and give us discretion in knowing how to support them 
and when we need to stand in accordance with your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first couple of questions are just basically a conversation. So if you want to throw out an idea, feel free. If not, you don't have to. But the first question, explain whether you think the United States is a Christian nation or not. Again, as always, online folks, we can hear you loud and clear. So if you want to participate and chime in with anything, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, speak up. So, Any thoughts on the first one? I think it's a nation with Christians living in it. I agree. So we got one. So a couple folks says it's a nation with Christians living in it. other religions had more rights than the Christians did. So Cheryl said that at times when she was working, she felt like Christians actually had less rights than maybe some of the other religions. And if you watch the inauguration, it was very Christian. You know. so. Yeah, so again, we got the inauguration piece, some of those Christian elements. The uh, nation was founded on biblical principles of self-government by our founders were mostly Christian. You might not like every part of the video then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you a heads up on that. <laughs> but yeah, so there is the idea that uh, a lot of the founding fathers were, you know, in Christians with Christian principles. Some of the gu guiding documents were based upon biblical principles. How about the next question? What would you say are characteristics of a Christian nation? Any thoughts on that? The laws reflect the Ten Commandments. So laws would reflect the Ten Commandments. Other thoughts? Anything else? belief that Jesus is our Savior. So the belief, that Christian belief, you know, that gospel thing built into it. The coins all have in God we trust. In God we trust in the coins. The Pledge of Allegiance is one nation under God. Yeah. So got the Pledge of Allegiance as well. We've got that reference, one nation under God. Well, do they still say the Pledge of Allegiance in the schools? Yeah, they do. do they? Uh, yeah, at Liberty Ridge, they say it, I think, one day a week or something, yeah. one or two days a week. <laughs> we don't do it anymore. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think, like, even I don't think in high school I ever said it. I mean, we used to do it every Monday during, like, advisory, but, like, we don't do it now. I went to Lutheran High School. <laughs> How about they do it at St. Croix? I have no idea. <laughs> You'd have to ask my daughter. I asked her how her day was. She's like, eh. <laughs> What'd you learn today? Eh. <laughs> it's lots of grunts. So her grades are good. So I'm assuming that's all right. So last one there. What benefits does a Christian nation bring to the work of the church? Any thoughts? I'll probably say that, again, the freedom, you know, to uh, practice the Christian faith, uh, the freedoms to gather, you know, to express that. I would say that would be a benefit. Those would be easier to talk about, like, openly. Yeah, easier to talk about openly. A super spreader? In what way? Like spreading the gospel? <laughs> <laughs> What was that? Churches are tax deductible. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't have any taxes. So if everyone you know got the same privilege. I still have no idea. Like I said, I'm not complaining, but I don't know the history, the background of the um, housing allowance for clergy, but I'm not complaining about it. So it works out to my benefit. So thank God for that tax law. All right, so we're gonna watch the video. This is about 15 minutes long today. Um, and again, 
some of the stuff saying, you know, uh, that they're going to say in here might come as a bit of, I wouldn't say a shock to you, but again, they're coming at it from uh, a very biblical point of view. Uh, again, the same two, we got uh, Dr. Dale Meyer, former speaker of the Lutheran Ministries, former president of Concordia Seminary, uh, now retired, then Dr. Joel Bierman, who is a professor at Concordia Seminary. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this up here. All right, so, oh, which one do we want to go to? Hey, the state basketball tournament brackets are up in case anybody's interested. So. <laughs> I know, yeah, you guys are at Park High, we're at Park High, home court advantage, now we're talking. All right, so. How we define a Christian nation is always bewildering to me. Uh, Christian meaning we're living according to Christ's precepts? No, and we never have been. Um, Christian as in there are many Christians who live here? Okay, I'll grant you that. Um, so far as whether we're founded on Christian principles, I would argue categorically we're not. Um, there are clearly influential Christians who were involved in the founding of this country, and there were clearly um, Christians who were coming here for the sake of their ability to worship freely and who made attempts to function in a Christian way in this nation. Pilgrims come to mind with the Mayflower Compact and others like that. But when it got down to actually doing the nation building with the um, work of the founding fathers, Madison and Jefferson and Franklin, these guys were driven much more by the principles of the Enlightenment than by Christian principles. Now the thing that gets confusing for many people, especially Christians today who want to make that argument that we are a Christian nation founded on Christian principles, is that there's a lot of overlap because the Enlightenment at the time of the uh, revolution and the founding of this country in the late 18th century, at that time, the Enlightenment was still compatible with a lot of Christian truth. There's a God, he holds us accountable, there is law, there is natural law. They agreed with all those things and Christians agree with those things. But the idea that that makes them Christian is, is really wrong-headed. And that's borne out when you read Jefferson's own personal stuff where he just rejects Christ as redeemer and rejects the idea of the, the gospel of resurrection. No, that's all gone. He's basically interested in moral people who are accountable to this judge and that's all they, he has. Welcome back to We the People, Citizens of Two Kingdoms. Have you ever heard anyone say that America is a Christian country because we have, in God we trust, on our money? A lot of people believe that. Actually, it was not until the Civil War that those words were first struck on a two-cent coin in 1864 because of increased religious sentiment. And it wasn't until 1883 that it was on all currency. Even more, the phrase did not become the motto of the United States until an act of Congress made it the national motto in 1956. But that phrase predates the Civil War. I'm pretty sure that most of us could sing the first line of the Star Spangled Banner from memory. Oh, say can you see by the dawn... It's our national anthem. 
During the War of 1812, as the morning light revealed that the battle-torn American flag still flew above Fort McHenry, Francis Scott Key wrote his poem, The Defense of Fort McHenry. It would later become known as the Star-Spangled Banner. In the fourth verse, which I have never heard anyone sing, it says, Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. In the Pledge of Allegiance, the phrase, one nation under God, did not become part of the pledge until 1954 after President Eisenhower heard a sermon by Reverend George Dougherty based on the Gettysburg Address. The sermon was titled, A New Birth of Freedom. The president was sitting in the pew that Abraham Lincoln used when he attended the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. The pastor argued that the nation's might lay not in arms, but in its spirit and higher purpose. He noted that the Pledge's sentiments could be those of any nation, that there was something missing in the Pledge, and that which was missing was a characteristic and definitive factor in the American way of life. He cited Lincoln's words, under God, as defining words that set the United States apart from other nations. The next day, Congressman Charles Oakman, at the urging of Eisenhower, no doubt, introduced a bill in the House to include those words, and the new pledge was adopted on June 14, 1954. Today we celebrate that day as Flag Day. Does that make America a Christian nation? Nope. In fact, in 1797, there was a treaty called the Treaty of Tripoli. It was passed by a unanimous vote. In Article 11 of that treaty was this statement, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. So while America was not officially founded on Christianity, the use of the word God might make it a religious one. But what God do we put our trust in? The value of having a God we trust in the money, though, I think, is the sense of accountability that that builds into us as a people, that there is a God who holds us accountable. And from my perspective, when you're talking about the left-hand realm, that's sufficient. I want people to know that there's a God who's gonna hold them accountable and his laws matter, and that's good. But that's not the same as the Christian God at all. In the Declaration of Independence, it mentioned nature's God. That could include anything from a tree to a buffalo, to whatever power greater than ourselves might be out there. This is called deism. Many of our nation's founders were confessed deist. Deism is the belief that the universe had a creator, but that he does not concern himself with the daily lives of humans. And he does not directly communicate with humans, either by revelation or by sacred books. They often spoke about God, nature's God, or the God of nature, but this was not the God of the Bible. Deism, in my mind, represents um, that spot where a man is becoming increasingly confident and essentially living out the Genesis 3 temptation. I'm my own God. We will make it our own way. We'll, we'll, we'll pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and off we go, which sounds really like the American ideal. Um, for running a country and building a nation, it's pretty good stuff. But as a Christian, not at all. Not at all. The use of the word God in our national motto, in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Declaration of Independence, and wherever else it might appear, is officially called ceremonial deism. Since 1963, the Supreme Court has used a concept called ceremonial deism to decide certain cases involving the use of this word. 
technically, it is related to the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What the court has said is that if a practice is customary, even if it has religious origins, then it may be beyond the reach of the Establishment Clause. In other words, the use of the word God does not establish a religion. Through this concept of ceremonial deism, the court has ruled that its use is protected from Establishment Clause scrutiny chiefly because they, that is the instances of the word God, have lost through rote repetition any significant religious content. In the first session, I asked the question, what role did Martin Luther play in the establishment of one of the most important freedoms we enjoy in America? It was the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, specifically the Establishment Clause and the Freedom Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. James Madison has been called the father of the Constitution and the author of the Bill of Rights. In a letter he wrote to Reverend Schaefer in 1821, Madison credits Luther with his doctrine of the two kingdoms for the American handling of church and state. Reverend sir, it illustrates the excellence of a system which by a due distinction to which the genius and courage of Luther led the way between what is due to Caesar and what is due to God best promotes the discharge of both obligations. And what was it about Luther's genius and courage? It has to do with Luther's doctrine of two kingdoms, the civil and the spiritual. Luther taught, God has ordained the two governments, the spiritual, which by the Holy Spirit under Christ makes Christians and pious people, and the secular, which restrains the unchristian and wicked so that they are obliged to keep the peace outwardly. Therefore, where temporal power presumes to prescribe laws for the soul, it encroaches upon God's government and only misleads and destroys souls. In the 13th chapter of Romans, Paul wrote, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. Whether the justices who sit on the Supreme Court realize it or not, they are there because God has established the government. Whether the senators and congressmen across the street in the Capitol building realize it or not, they are there because God has established government. Whether the President of the United States believes it or not, he is there because God established government. And why? For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Paul also says, consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Romans 13 is a demanding text and a really hard text. It's always helpful to remember that when Paul wrote the text of Romans 13, the immediate context was the Roman Empire. And we're not just talking about some of the beneficent emperors. Most likely Paul was writing this when Nero was running the show. And Nero was no friend of the Christians. Um, Nero was not a friend of too many people. So Paul was able to say about government that it is God's government and God uses it for his purposes, even about a uh, corrupt emperor like Nero. So when we find ourselves in situations that are disagreeable and even wrong, we have to be very careful before we quickly rise up to say, well, this government is illegitimate, needs to be pushed out. Because you can make the case that Nero was an illegitimate ruler, but Paul wasn't ready to um, um, foment rebellion. Um, Luther himself exemplifies this. The leaders are God's leaders. Uh, even if they're less than desirable, even if they're not Christian, even if they're persecuting the church, they're still God's leaders. Why God allows them to exist, I don't know. 
And that's where we have to sometimes plead, don't understand it, but my responsibility is to speak against what is wrong, to fight against what is un unjust, and yet to still be faithful to God. Luther fully supported obeying the civil authorities. He also fully supported disobeying them when they extended their authority into the spiritual kingdom. Listen to what he said. We are to be subject to governmental power and do what it bids as long as it does not bind our conscience, but legislates only concerning outward matters. But if it invades the spiritual domain and constrains the conscience over which God only must preside and rule, we should not obey it at all, but rather lose our necks. Now, we live in a democratic republic where, for the most part, the civil kingdom has not encroached on the beliefs of the spiritual kingdom. But throughout history, there have been totalitarian governments, dictators, and persecutors of the faithful. What shall the Christian do then? Hear the church, and someday that might mean you and me, must refuse obedience even if it means martyrdom. And what does this mean? All right, so before we look at the questions, uh, just initial thoughts on what uh, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Bierman uh, shared in today's video. I guess we should be thankful that we can worship as we do. Yeah, yeah, that, that freedom that we have, you know, in men's Bible study, I guess in God's timing today, we're going through Romans. So this morning we looked at Romans 13, which is what they talked about here. And, um, you know, that's one of the things, you know, we talked about today, there is no such thing as a perfect country. Um, you know, our country has plenty of issues like every country. Uh, but when you take a step back and you realize how much, especially from the church's point of view, how many freedoms we have to meet peacefully, uh, to be able to uh, uh, worship freely, to be able to live out the gospel and share the gospel freely, um, it is a wonderful gift. And so we should be very thankful and grateful for that. So uh, Dean makes a good point. And the initial thoughts before we look at some of the questions. I've just been reading a book about uh, Washington, or George Washington, our founding father and first president. And the uh, writers of this book did extensive research into his journals, and he was definitely a Christian. Good. Good. Your thoughts. Just initial reactions. Well, let's take a look at this. And again, as we go through it, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to sit here and say that, hey, you know, if you, you know, are, are really, uh, you know, gung ho and you say, nope, we are a Christian nation, we're founded on Christian principles. Unlike again, what they said about some of those uh, Enlightenment deistic principles. Again, I, I'm not going to try to persuade you out of that. The biggest thing that I really hope we take away from this is, again, what we keep coming back to is the doctrine on these two kingdoms. But again, God is in control of both, but each has a different calling, a different purpose. And so we don't ever want, because it's not the purpose, the calling of the government to be espousing Christian principles in the sense that they're out preaching the gospel in the same way we don't want churches going out trying to establish laws. Um, and so, again, the church's call, role and calling is to proclaim the gospel, to speak the word of God, and the, the, the civil realm is there to watch over society, to maintain peace. Again, the first use of law kind of keep things, you know, the, the, the curb uh, in check there. And so some of these things, it says, is the United States a Christian nation? Again, we looked at this, you know, it depends on what is necessary to make a country, quote, Christian. And so we have some of these models. We talked about these uh, before, you know, a model like in God We Trust. Uh, posting the commandments in our courthouses, putting nativity scenes in our town squares, uh, having a school prayer. Um, and again, a lot of these, you know, are, I would say, areas that are kind of gray areas. 
you know, where if we're going to say, all right, we have the doctrine of the two kingdoms, is it the city's job to be putting up nativity scenes in public spaces? You know, we could have a conversation around that. I would actually argue one is that's not their job. You know, their job isn't to be out there putting nativity scenes up, even the Ten Commandments. Um, again, a lot of our laws are connected to that because, again, that is the moral law. You know, we talk about this in, in confirmation all the time, um, that uh, the moral law is written into the human heart. All right, so you can go uh, to the middle of a country in the middle of the jungle that has never heard of Jesus or the Bible, and you can ask them, hey, if I shoot this guy right here, is that okay? And they're going to say, no, you probably shouldn't kill that guy, you know. There's something wrong with that. So stuff like murder, stuff like adultery, stealing. Again, that's bound into the moral law. And so, again, a lot of our laws are ultimately reflected in that. Uh, you know, school prayer, you know, there hasn't been, you know, school prayer allowed for quite a while, even although in some areas that is. But, again, that's a question. Is that the school's job? Is that the public school's job uh, to be leading prayer or is it not? Are they crossing that boundary? Um, and, again, you can have those conversations. But, again, what this does is understanding what Luther was really driving at with this doctrine, this teaching of the two kingdoms is, again, God's in control of both, but each one has a different calling, a different purpose, and different functions. And so when we start crossing over, and so again, this is where, you know, it's, uh, well, first of all, it's not, I mean, technically you could do it, but then you risk losing your nonprofit status. But if a church starts uh, endorsing candidates from the pulpit, Again, they, they, they really risk, because technically that's against the law, and they, they risk losing that nonprofit ability because now they're promoting something. But even beyond that, I would, I would ask the question, is that the church's job to promote certain candidates over other candidates? Now, again, there's a difference between that, and that's where you have the conversation. It's where it gets a little gray. You know, should a church be proclaiming um, certain issues, biblical issues, and say, listen, if there's a candidate that doesn't align with this, you should think hard and long about voting for them. And again, that's a conversation. That's where it starts to get the gray area. But again, we have these guiding principles. But again, the, the problems that we start to get into, and I think we've seen this over the last, you know, uh, you know, I'll go back to the, the riot at the Capitol. You know, again, it, it elicited a lot of conversation, a lot of articles. I had, you know, people sending articles my way, um, you know, quite a bit on this issue of uh, what's, uh, become known as Christian nationalism. Um, that basically is the idea that we are a Christian nation and we need to fight even violently to reclaim that Christian identity. And again, that's where you start to ask yourself, all right, how does this align with what scripture says? And so, uh, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Um, no. There we go. Um, so let's, uh, I want to go down here um to take a look at these passages so again separating church and state and we talk about this separation of church and state we mean it differently than what the public sphere means so a lot of people and again come from outside the church when they talk about the separation of church and state they basically say the church and the state should never intermix that they should have nothing to do with each other so basically church should say private keep your faith private don't force it on anyone else that's not what we mean. When we talk about the separation of church and state, we simply say, like we've been saying all along, they're two separate entities with two different callings by God for two different functions for the sake of his creation. So again, the civil realm exists because God has ordained it to guide and care for the citizens. The church exists for the proclamation of the gospel. God is Lord over both. Again, we're talking about this here in a little bit, but again, this is where it starts to get a little muddy and mucky and how do you actually live this out? You know, stuff like Romans 13. Uh, we talked about it at Men's Bible Study this morning. All right. So uh, that was one of the passages uh, that was uh, used heavily by Lutheran churches in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. So basically, in light of that passage, they said, well, we're supposed to submit to our governing authorities. And then they became patsies for the Nazi regime. And then you've got Luther, or not Luther, uh, Bonhoeffer comes along. And all of a sudden he's saying something is not right here. And then he's actively participating in trying to assassinate Hitler. All right. So again, how do we put some of this stuff into practice? Well, let's start by looking at um, the role of the, the church and uh, the government. So again, it says here, separating church and state. Again, we understand it through the lens of the two kingdoms. Martin Luther described how God has established two kingdoms in this world. 
These are earthly or man-made governments and his church. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, God sets out his expectation for each of these two kingdoms. So 1 Timothy 2, uh, this is a very well-known passage. But again, Paul tells us uh, this. He says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So as they continue in the study guide, it's easy to focus on the here and now, but mankind's greatest need by far is salvation from eternal death and hell. God remedied this desperate situation by sending Jesus to suffer and die for our sins. He has called us to proclaim the gospel to all nations. So the question here, what happens to the church's work of sharing Christ when a government cannot maintain peace through law and order? How does that affect the church's work? Any thoughts? It's quiet. <clears throat> yeah. So Sue mentioned it makes it more difficult. And again, you, you see this. So when all of a sudden, uh, we talk about this, again, the men's Bible say, but when you look at the rapid spread of Christianity in those first few centuries, Again, it's largely contributed to what was called the Pax Romana, the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. And so you had this very unique period of time after Jesus' resurrection where the world was essentially at peace. There wasn't major conflicts. Rome was kind of in control of everything. And so you were able to travel freely without fear of conflict. Uh, again, Rome wasn't, as uh, Dr. Bierman said, a friend of the Christians. But again, there was a peaceful environment. There was a safe environment. And this allowed Christians to travel freely, to engage with others without, you know, chaos and disruption. And this allowed for the spread of the gospel and the boom of the church as the Spirit worked through that. Now, again, you flip that around and we see this in countries uh, around the world now where you have chaos, you have war, you have disorder, you have violence. Uh, and how much more challenging it is not only for Christians to meet, uh, to gather together for the sake of the gospel, but also to spread the gospel. Uh, I mentioned this a few times, and I'll mention it again, but sometime this summer, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lo, so uh, Feng Chao Lo. He preached here a couple of years ago, but uh, he's done mission work in uh, Southeast Asia. And even now, he's teaching and preaching over there via the internet. Uh, but he's had multiple classes get shut down because whenever people gather, the police come and they stop it. They put things to an end because they don't allow gathering in any kind in this way and so you see when there's you know chaos or disruption or uh upheaval or uh unjust governments how that can disrupt the gathering of christians also the proclamation of the gospel well the flip side again and we experience this now we have again the freedoms to gather but also the freedoms to share and again when we look at these passages that paul talks about why we pray for godly government a big main driving force is for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel so that we can worship together freely, but also so that we can share the gospel with others that they too can hear it. And so when you look at this next question, it says, in what areas do you see government encroaching into areas God has assigned to the church? So is anything coming in the mind of where the church might be, or the government, excuse me, might be stepping into the role of the church? Again, a lot of these issues are going to be, you know, you can have a conversation that might be debated, but you can say, you know what, I think you're overstepping. And we talked about this last week. Yeah, we don't have a small government, all right? You know, uh, the, the government is everywhere. <laughs> Every look is the government, all right? So, again, there's going to be areas where you ask yourself, you know, I'll throw out one. Um, stuff like uh, care for the poor, all right? So, uh, um, human care programs. Caring for the widow and the needy. Is that the government's job or is that the church's job? It used to be just the church's uh, responsibility. Yeah, when you look at the role of the church in the early church, that was a big aspect to it. 
again, I'm not saying it's definitive that they're encroaching there, but you can start to have those conversations. And you say, all right, do we need to be dependent upon the government to do these you know, programs for the poor, for the single mother, for the children? Or does the church need to say, you know what, government, we can do this much better. Because <laughs> we can serve them not only with physical needs, but also spiritual needs and emotional needs. You know, what about education? Again, I'm, I'm not going to start a public versus you know, private school debate here, but you start to think about this. Is the role of educating children the role of government or is that the role of the church? And again, that's where you can have conversations about it. But when you start to look at it through the lens of, you know, God has given a calling to the government, God has given a calling to the church, and they're different and distinct, but they are supposed to be symbiotic. Because again, God is in control overall. You can start to ask some of these questions. Again, some of these things it's hard to think about. You know, school is a big one. We've gotten so used to having you know government run. You know, you got these state run public schools that have all this funding. And so when you ask the question, again, I'm not sure what, necessarily what you do about it. But when you ask the question, is that really the government's job? Same with, um, like I said, care for the poor. When you start listing, <laughs> looking at some of the the roles of the church in the Book of Acts. You know, you can start to ask, all right, how many of these things are now being handed over to the government? And is that a good thing or not? Like I said, I'm not here to say it has to be this way or that way. But some to start thinking about, you know, especially as we look at it through the lens of it. On the flip side there, you know, do you see areas where the church is encroaching on the responsibility that God has given to governments? You know, in what ways, again, this comes in with that Christian nationalism where, Again, we want uh, the, um, you know, I'll put it this way. This, again, I'm not going to give you an answer, you know, but should, um, uh, you know, when, when uh, let's say when Congress meets, uh, should Congress open with a Christian prayer? You know, should that be a place where prayer is taking place or are we crossing lines? You know, is there a difference between, having a mandated prayer in school or having a chaplain come in to pray over a school or over government, you know, is there lines that are being crossed or, or what does that look like? Again, that's where it starts to get a little bit interesting and people have different opinions and that's perfectly fine. As long as we keep our guiding principles of God's order for his creation of the left-hand kingdom, the right-hand kingdom. And we want to make sure that if we start to see overstepping boundaries that we say, you know what, this isn't going to go well. Because again, if the government starts being asked to do what the church is supposed to do with the proclamation of the gospel, the proclamation of the law in the biblical law, then it's not going to work well. And likewise, if the, the church starts to, uh, uh, you know, basically function as overseers of society, as the government, again, same thing, it's just not going to go well because that's not what God has designed them to do. Again, next week, we're going to look at how we can be involved in the government, how we can be faithful um, citizens and we're going to focus on that next week but again for today and again some of these things as well like i said it's more for conversation um because i don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer but stuff like this you know how much should the government and the church have uh in the following situations so natural disasters uh homelessness travel works these things that we've talked about so feeding the hungry uh clothing poor utility payments uh with hurricanes fire flood tornadoes um you know should that be something that say all right that's the government's job or is that the church's job Again, I think you can have conversations and allow the biblical view of the two kingdoms guide you through this. Yes, Cal. So, you know, when you're talking about natural disasters, some of those things I think are just too big for a church to do. Yeah. I mean, how, you know, how do we as a church deal with freezing Texas? Yeah. And that's and that's where you start to look at it and say, all right. How do we deal with Katrina yeah, yeah. years ago? We could have never helped. The churches could never have helped out yeah. at, at, at those levels. But I will say this. When you look at, a, you know, I'll speak of one of the other chaplains I work with. He works with uh, a ministry, and they go into these natural disasters, and they do relief work. And so when you look at, and again, this is where, you know, you might, talk through, all right, some of the infrastructure stuff. All right, so is it the church's job to get the power plants up and running again? I would say no. I mean, what's up, do anything? 
is it the church's job to step up and come together to collect food, uh, to collect water, uh, to serve, to support? Um, I would say, you know what, that might be more of what we're called to do. So again, even there, you, you're trying to wade through some of these things. And like I said, I'm not saying that we have to be doing one thing or another, but these are things that we want to keep in mind um, and, and say, all right, what is our calling as a church? Again, I would argue, especially based upon Acts chapter 2, when it describes and lays out what the early church looked like. Again, a lot of that humanitarian efforts was being done solely by the church. That was expected. And even early on, you know, you can think of a lot of the hospitals that exist. You know, they, you know the government, or I'll tell you this, any, any hospital that starts with the word saint was not started by a government agency. <laughs> <laughs> So at some point, that was founded by a religious organization. Now, over time, they all get bought out. And now it's all, you know, basically one or two organizations anyway that oversees everything. Um, but again, you look at some of that as well. Um, so again, it's just something that you want to keep in mind and say, all right, you know, is there stuff that maybe we need to recapture? You know, we, do we need to do a better job of getting involved in human care, partnering with other organizations? Uh, again, a lot of the resources, it's bigger than just one congregation. It's a lot of churches coming together. Uh, you know, the LCMS has uh, a lot of work they do for relief efforts. So trying to do this kind of work at a large scale. Uh, and so, again, as churches trying to figure out how can we be a part of that, understanding that, you know, as Cal brings up, some of the, the stuff is just way too big. But, again, if it's infrastructure stuff, you know, rebuilding, you know, power plants, uh, rebuilding roads, we're saying, you know, what, that's what the government's supposed to do. But again, the human care stuff, how do we step up to the plate more and partner with others? Uh, and again, you know, we donate, you know, every single one of us goes to Costco for four bucks. You can get 20, uh, you know, a 48 pack of, you know, bottled water. And every person does that. And all of a sudden we've got, you know, a hundred cases and, you know, then Woodbury Lutheran's got it. And all of a sudden all these churches, and that's where you start to see the, the work. And so again, all of a sudden, uh, it's banding together for the humanitarian work. But again, um, you know, it, like I said, putting things into practice is often more difficult, but it's for us to understand what is our role, what's our calling, what's the church's calling, and what's the government's calling. Um, so Romans 13 verse 2 says, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Uh, so, um, you know, some of these, you know, speed limits, I laugh, um, Speed suggestions, I think we should put that. Uh, <laughs> smoking bans. Who would ban smoking, you know, meat and stuff? <laughs> Fishing road, motorcycle, you know, uh, declaration of war. Um, so again, you look at some of these and say, all right, the government puts these in place for the, the safety of others. Um, you know, I'm going to skip down to this. Um, da, 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 oh, I guess that's a closing prayer. But I want to get to uh, the civil disobedience is, again, they talk about in here, you know, the instances, and, and I think this is a good way to go about it, is our standard procedure, our standard state should be one of understanding that we belong to the church, uh, that the church's role is a proclamation of God's word, the proclamation of the gospel. The state's job is to care for the citizens, you know, to keep things under control. Uh, and we should be praying for our leaders. We should be respectful to our leaders. But in instances where there is direct conflict with God's word, we say, you know what? You say that, but God's word says this, and so God's word will always win. And so I would say that's where, going back to the 30s and 40s Lutherans in Germany, this is where I would argue they missed the boat. Because they were respectful to the authorities, but also the authorities are oppressing people. You know, the, for the Jews, they were rounding up the Jews, and they were doing this and that and the other. And the Bible is very clear about how we are to treat all humanity. And so what they should have said is, I know the government is saying this, but this is what God's word says, and God's word wins out. So I'm going to listen to that. And, and here's the thing, and the reality is, as Dr. Meyer said, when those moments come where the government says one thing, the God's word says another thing, and we say we pick the side and the side is always God's word, that's where you start to risk persecution. Again, thanks be to God, we do live in a nation where um, we've never really experienced true persecution as they see else. We, we may you know, experience hardships because of our faith. Uh, we may face opposition or ridicule, you know, mockery. And again, these are all things, <laughs> I'm going to argue to you, you might not want to hear this, but we should expect these things. All right. 
Jesus is very clear. He says, if they've treated the master in such a way, they killed him, how do you expect to be treated as followers? You know, Paul and Peter said the same thing. Do not be surprised when you are persecuted for your faith, when you're treated this way because of Christ. In fact, you know, I think as Paul says, consider it great joy when you suffer all kinds of trials for the sake of Christ. So again, when we face any sort of hardships, we shouldn't be surprised by that. In fact, we should expect that. But again, we should also be prepared that in those moments when the governments would ever say, listen, you can't meet together to worship Jesus, we say, try and stop us. And then they probably will. And you see that happen in other countries. You pray and you pray and you pray. It never happens in our country. But again, you've seen it happen in other countries where the government tries to step in. Again, Dr. Lowe has many stories in the countries that he's worked in where that's exactly the thing going on. So again, this is one of the reasons why we pray for our leaders, we pray for our government, that we would have the peace and the freedom to exercise the Christian faith, to share the Christian faith as God has called us to do. Uh, and as we talk about these other issues, remember, again, just keep this principle in mind, these two kingdoms, and let that be our guide. Um, so hopefully that all made sense. Hopefully made it clear some things Hopefully you're not want to argue too much. Huh? Cal. So, in light of this, how would the Revolutionary War stand? <laughs> <laughs> you would ask that question. Uh, <laughs> so, if, if we're going strictly on biblical principles, and this is why... Again, reflecting what Dr. Meyer and Dr. Uh, Bierman said, um, the, the Christian principles for our country are probably more deistic principles. I would, I would personally agree with that. Because if we're going strictly on biblical principles, again, when Peter said, you know, Peter's in front of the Sanhedrin, they said, you cannot preach the resurrection. Peter said, we must obey God rather than man. I'm not sure uh, proclaiming the gospel and being taxed on tea are at the same level. <laughs> um, so, you know, from a, a non-biblical point of view, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you start to get into some of the weeds and you do look, and again, I'm not sitting here to say, you live there, you, you go along with the patriots. You know how they were persecuted. So it's, you know, some of those things you say, all right, is that a, biblical reason to rebel it's like well it's history what are you going to do about it yeah. uh but it, it does make things a little more interesting um so but again we thank god for the country we live in we're blessed to live Absolutely. here yeah. um Absolutely. and uh we're thankful for it and um but again i would say if I, I'll, and I'll end with this i would say i think it frees us up if 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 we tie ourselves to the idea that america has to be a christian nation where it's always built on christian everything uh, then you have to explain everything you did and try to, maybe you might feel like you have to justify everything. On the flip side, when you say, you know, you look at some of the his, things in history, you say, you know what, we're a country. We're a country that's built upon these principles. We thank God for the country we live in, but not everything we've ever done is Christian. And so we say, you know, the Tea Party, you know, the Boston Tea Party, you can say, is that a biblical act? Is that faithful to Romans 13 and what Peter says? You say, I don't know, but you know what? The government did it. The government did a revolution, and now I get to live in America, and I'm not complaining. So uh, I don't speak English or uh, British English. I don't have to drink tea. I don't have to have crumpets all the time. You know, I can watch football, real American football. I thank God for that. So, um, and again, here's the thing. is like you look at how God works. He works, you know, since he's over government, you know, even Cyrus, you know, you go to the Old Testament. Cyrus was called God's servant. Cyrus was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He was not an Israelite. He was not a godly man, but God says, I'm using this guy to rescue my people, to bring them back to Jerusalem. And so again, even we look back at some of our stuff and say, you know what? I wouldn't say that this action was biblical, but God still used it for the good of the nation and ultimately for the good of us. And uh, and then we can be okay with that. So. Think of the United States actions during World War II. Yeah. And what would have happened if the United States hadn't been able to yeah. amass the arms and people yeah. to defeat Hitler. Yeah. This was part of God's plan. Yeah. So we could go on and realize I got 
two minutes until church starts. So, so let me close with a prayer. And again, there's one in your handout you can go through later, but let me say a really quick prayer for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you are in control of all things, uh, of the state and of the church. Uh, Lord, allow us to rejoice in uh, good, godly government. Allow us to rejoice in a church that proclaims the gospel and the law. And uh, Lord, allow us to be able to uh, distinguish between the two and faithfully serve in both. We pray all this in the morning in your name, Jesus. Amen.